Nightstar, our mission is to maintain and restore vision in patients who otherwise will go blind as a result of an inherited retinal disease. And to that end, we are building a world-class leading ocular gene therapy company. Our lead asset is for choroideremia, which is in phase three. And more recently in June, we received a RMAT designation for the program from the FDA. We've seen in investigator-sponsored trial data a very durable signal uh, in a number of patients. We've actually seen that signal out to five years. Our second program is for X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. That's in a dose escalation study. And we have a number of programs that have been licensed from the University of Oxford. And our objective was to license in monogenic diseases that had large prevalent populations, and we certainly have done that. So our pipeline looks like this, a choroideremia program, the X-linked retinitis pigmentosa program. We have a third program in IND-enabling studies. That's for Stargardt's disease, one of the largest juvenile macular diseases. We have an additional program in Best disease, and then we have several programs looking at various forms of retinitis pigmentosa. We've spent the last few years working very closely with the tertiary centers that take care of these inherited retinal disease patients. These are typically the large hospitals and also have the surgical capability to do the subretinal surgery, working both in Europe and in the US. So quickly on choroideremia, quick primer on this disease. It's a slow degenerating disease. It does cause blindness. There's no treatment option today. It's a result of a mutation in the CHM gene, which encodes for REP1. REP1 is an escort protein that's responsible for eliminating toxins from the intracellular tissues, the RPE tissue, and the photoreceptors. Absent that, the toxins build up and cause premature cell death. And the cascade of vision loss looks like this, night blindness, peripheral vision loss, and then it encroaches on the central macula and results in, finally, complete profound vision loss. So a normal patient starts with normal vision, obviously, and then they lose mid-peripheral vision sometime in their mid-20s. They start to lose and come down to islands of vision in their 30s, and by the time they get into their 40s and 50s, they're down to really a pinhole vision, and ultimately that closes out and they are profoundly blind. So the technique is a subretinal delivery. You can see the middle panel there is the subretinal injection. You can see the shadow of the cannula going into the macular area. That's a 41-gauge cannula to deliver the vector. On the right-hand side, you can see the interoperative OCT. So this is real-time imaging that's provided to the physician. And what they're intending to do is to confirm that they get the vector into the correct plane. And you can imagine you're working in microns of tissue, so it's really critical to be able to visualize real time where that vector is going. We've incorporated that into all of our phase three trials ongoing. So if you talk to patients, if you talk to physicians, what are they looking for? They're looking for maintaining the vision they have, these patients that have choroideremia. So we've built a very robust clinical program in choroideremia. It's really underpinned by three programs. The first one is a natural history trial, the largest of its kind, over 250 patients that have been enrolled over the last several years, these and our subset of these patients are rolling right into our phase three trial. Second one is the regenerate trial. This is up at Oxford. This is looking at earlier stage patients with choroideremia who have high visual acuity, high function. The goal here is to do a larger area and show if you treat these patients early, you might be able to salvage more of their vision. We think this will be very critical for supporting the approval, but also for payers and reimbursement agencies as we go forward. And the last one is our phase three trial. That's the STAR study. That's on, ongoing right now. That trial is looking at proportion responders in the treated arm versus the untreated arm. And we're looking specifically at 15 letter gainers. 15 letters is the classical FDA hurdle for demonstrating efficacy. And it's based on that ETDRS chart, which you can see on the left-hand side, which is the gold standard for determining visual acuity. The RMAT designation was really based on this maintenance data. So you can see here, comparison between the treated group in the green, which was in the investigator-sponsored trial, and the blue bar, which is the natural history trial. And what you see at one year, in the treated group, 8% of those patients lost vision, or 90% maintained their vision, 13% in the natural history trial. So slight separation at one year. If you move forward uh, to the two-year data, you can see 8% lost more than a line of vision in the treated arm. But the untreated group, 22% have had lost more than a line of vision. So we're beginning to see the separation there that you'd expect in a chronic debilitating disease like choroideremia. 
In terms of the regulatory endpoint, we're looking for hyper-responders or 15-letter gainers. So what we've seen in the investigator-sponsored trial data is uh, roughly 21% of the patients have had a 15-letter gain. You contrast that to the natural history trial where we're seeing 1%. So if we're able to replicate this trial in a phase three pivotal trial, we believe we have an approvable drug in choroideremia. The safety profile well tolerated so far in the 32 patients that have been treated in a high and a low dose. Basically, the surgical events are pretty much keeping with what you'd expect in subretinal surgery. Two treatment-related serious adverse events. One was intraocular inflammation. The other one related to a gas bubble in the surgical tubing. Phase three trial design looks like this. So it's three arms, high dose, low dose, and a control no-sham arm. So no-sham. Uh, the FDA encouraged us to include a low dose for masking purposes. Uh, in our trials, we call it uh, masking, not blinding, as you can imagine. So the endpoint is 15-letter gains at one, at one year in the high dose versus the control no-sham arm. We're also looking at a number of secondary endpoints along the way. So switching gears to our X-linked retinitis pigmentosa program, this is a, again, degenerative disease, primarily affects the photoreceptors. About 10 to 20 percent of all of RP is X-linked, and of that, 70 percent is related to the mutation in the RPGR gene, about 17,000 patients between E5 and the U.S., and you can see this moves much quicker. So these patients tend to be functionally blind by their mid-40s. If you talk to physicians and patients, they often say they're severely debilitated by their mid-20s. Similar progression, night blindness, peripheral vision loss, then central vision loss. So we're talking about the photoreceptor. You all know from your biology days, the photoreceptor captures light and turns it into electrical signal. The photoreceptor has two segments, the inner segment, the outer segment. The inner segment houses the mitochondrial machinery in the cell body. The outer segment is a series of discs, like a series of stacked tires. Those are responsible for capturing the uh, photons and converting those into the electrical signal. The cilium is critical here because that's that inner seg or that's the connection between the inner and outer segment. That's where the RPGR complex is located. And the RPGR is responsible for trafficking of proteins between the inner and outer segment. If that's disrupted, you start to lose those outer segments, and that shortens and shortens, and ultimately, you have profound vision loss. So we've entered into a phase one, two trial. There's two parts to it. There's the dose escalation component of it, which we've just completed, 18 patients completed in that. And now we're moving on to the expansion study, which will start in the fourth quarter. We're enrolling, or we enrolled in the first part of that, patients older than 18. We're moving that down to patients in 10 years in the expansion study. This is a safety study, but we're also looking at secondary endpoints on the efficacy side. And one of those efficacy measures we were looking at was microperimetry. Now, what microperimetry does is it measures sensitivity of the retina in the central 20 degrees, which is the macula. And how it does that is through the Maya machine. Patient puts their head in that headrest, has a button, and they take an OCT image of the macula, and then you overlay a map of 68 stimulus points. The machine goes through an algorithm, and it varies the light level to determine whether the patient is picking up varying degrees of light level. So you and I, if we took this machine, we'd be largely in that green portion, meaning we're seeing the dimmest stimulus. A patient like this, which is an X-linked retinitis pigmentosa patient, probably pretty advanced. You can see there are a number of black spots. A black spot means they're not picking up the brightest stimulus. And you can see the only seen part of the macula there is that central portion, which goes in line with the disease as it moves. It moves from the outside in. And you can see that the images there are largely purple. Now, it's all measured in decibels, so you can see in that bottom scale there, once you're down into the red and into the purple range, you're barely picking up the brightest stimulus. So this would be a relatively low-functioning patient. So what we've seen in the phase one, two dose escalation phase in the 15 patients we've treated, we have three more that have been treated. We just don't have any data on them. Um, no early discontinuations, no dose-limiting toxicities, no serious treatment AEs. We saw some mild transient inflammation in cohorts four and five, and we've been able to escalate to the highest dose. We definitely believe we have a efficacy signal demonstrated. Uh, we think it's dose dependent. Uh, we've seen that efficacy signal in cohorts three, four, and five. We don't have cohort six data yet. 
We've seen it across multiple microperimetry analysis and multiple time points. So this is an example of one of the patients. You can see on the top left-hand panel, this would be their baseline, and treat, baseline for their treated and untreated. Un, the treated is in green, the untreated is in white. So you can see pretty much similar baseline readings. Move over to, over to one month, and what you see there is not only is the area of seeing retina expanding, but the magnitude of the response is so that colors are changing. And those colors changing, meaning they're picking up a less bright response. They're moving from purple to red in some cases, in some cases red to yellow. So that is a significant improvement. Look at month three, and you can see the area continuing to expand, almost covering the entire macula, which is 20 degrees again. And out at month six, you can see it continues. So based on this, we're certainly we're surprised to see this after one month, but very encouraged that it continues out at six months. We've done several analysis to confirm what we think is definitely a treatment response. The three different analysis we looked at on the top left-hand panel is a mean analysis. Now, the mean analysis looks at the increase over those 68 points. And if you draw the bar at two, you can see we're significantly over that. Over that. The test to retest variability of the mean of those 68 points is thought to be right around one to one and a half decibels. So clearly above the test retest variability. Another analysis we performed is looking at the central 16 loci on that grid. And as you'd expect, those are the more sensitive ones. That's the, the most preserved photoreceptors. If you look there, we saw a, quite a profound increase, six decibels in cohort three. Uh, and then if you look at the analysis on the bottom, we're looking at a percentage of loci that had a five decibel improvement. Uh, and in this case, we, we chose 10%. 10% would be roughly seven loci, 10% of the 68 points. The FDA often talks about five discrete points. So we drew the bar a little bit higher, looking at seven decibels. And you can see there in the cohort three, we're seeing um, all of those patients had greater than five decibels at, 10, or at seven loci. So we're very encouraged when we look at all of those analysis. And then we did a waterfall plot looking at both month one and month six, looking at the treated versus the untreated, the treated in green. And this is looking at various decibel levels, starting all the way from one decibel where you would get some noise, moving all the way up to seven decibels. And you can see in all cases, the treated eye outperforms the untreated eye and it persists out to six months. So very encouraging result from our perspective. So upcoming milestones, we believe we'll finish enrollment in the first half in 2019 for the Choroideremia program and a readout in 2020 on that program. And on the RPGR program, we're going to have six-month follow-up data on the dose escalation study by Q2 of this year. By mid-2019, we'll have preliminary data from the expansion study that we started in Q4, and then we'll have a full one-year data on the dose escalation study in Q4 of 2019. And then 2020, we would expect to have one-year data from the expansion study. So in summary, we're farthest along in choroideremia. We've got a strong proof of concept signal in retinitis pigmentosa. We've got a third program in Stargardt that's moving ahead rapidly. And we have some great catalysts coming in 2019 and 20. Thank you very much. Thank you.